Yo, what's shaking, everybody? Welcome to another edition of OB at Night. I'm Jeff Ketchum. It's going to be me and you all night long, or at least for like the next hour or so. No sponsors for this, if I'm not mistaken. It's just going to be a whole lot of us talk, talking Texas football, Texas recruiting, even a little Texas baseball with the College World Series and the Longhorns set to begin. <laughs> and Steven Henderson's like the gummies track meet. I don't know about all that, but we're going to have a good time. And I think more than anything, uh, we're going to be taking a lot of your questions and answers. Like I don't have, usually I come into these things and I've got a full rundown of things that I want to get into. Uh, not necessarily that tonight. I want to be interactive. I want to talk about the things that you guys want to talk about. Uh, I will start off by kind of just piggybacking off of the, uh, you know, the weight of the Arch Manning visit coming up uh, at the, you know, this weekend, I was gonna say at the end of the week on Friday, going into this weekend, uh, you know, it's, it's importance to this year's Texas recruiting class really can't be emphasized enough. It's funny. One of the questions in the comments I just put up on the board, when does the recruiting momentum begin the plan? It's funny today is june 15th i just wanted to double check uh and make sure that i wasn't crazy i actually had a conversation with a source last month that believed that today was going to be a day that we would see some commitments it's funny we saw the john Tate cook tweet earlier today for those that missed it uh all everything wide receiver john Tate cook one of the top guys in this class that the longhorns actually have a really good chance to land when it's all said and done, uh, including, uh, you know, I've already put in a future cast that he will end up being a Longhorn. You know, he seven hours ago said soon with a running hourglass. There's some, an some anticipation or there was some anticipation that John Tate Cook would commit today, as a matter of fact. It's just something I had heard. And the grapevine more than a month ago, it didn't happen. I think the thought process was as Arch Manning getting ready to come into his visit this weekend, I think they wanted to show that there could be, there was going to be some momentum that wasn't necessarily, yes, Robbins, I know. Let me tell you what happened real quick before I go, go in deep on the John Tay Cook thing. This was going to be on our show. And last night I was going to go. Then I had an issue pop up last night. And then Anwar had something pop up today. So I'm just filling in. Uh... <laughs> Whoa, hello, Tom. That's what I'm talking about. The Super Chat starting out uh, with a bang. $100 Super Chat. Catch After Dark. I love it. Supporting Orange Bloods. Tom and we love you. Yeah, get your likes in. EJ writes like only four likes. Absolutely. Let's get some likes in here. Let's subscribe to the channel. We're creeping up um, on 12,000. So like, let's go ahead and make that right. And yes, EJ, that was absolutely worth um, some eyeball emojis with Tom G stepping up right out of the gates with one of the bigger uh, super chat donations that we've had. So back to the John Tay Cook thing. I think there was an early, and by the way, we're going to be going for about an hour or so. So we're five, you know, um, what's the best way to watch this? I mean, you know, you can find the archives on YouTube, how you watch it live. Eric kind of comes down to like what your preferences are. You can obviously watch it. One of the reasons we use this platform is it allows us to use Facebook and YouTube uh, at the same exact time. And by the way, let's just... Let Tom G know with the super chat thing. You get a couple of questions now, Tom. Anything that you want answered, I will come to you. I do appreciate you supporting orangebloods.com and our Orange Bloods videos. Those super chat donations make doing these shows and paying for producers and, uh, and our entire video thing an absolute positive. All right. Back to John Tay Cook, the thought process was that before Arch Manning showed up for his visit this weekend, that Texas would go ahead and get some momentum going, going in, so that Arch doesn't necessarily feel like the weight of the world. 
is on his shoulders because the Longhorns are very seriously considering him. But one of the differences between Texas and Alabama and Georgia is that Texas is the only school in the mix that doesn't need Arch Manning to kickstart recruiting uh, momentum. That with or without Arch Manning, those other schools are going to have badass recruiting classes. And yet you look at the 2023 Texas Longhorn recruiting class, it's not something that I would say panic over. As a matter of fact, I wrote a column on Sunday night saying to do the exact opposite. Hold the rope. Don't, don't get into panic mode just because the Longhorns are now up to six commitments uh, with the commitment of Spencer Shannon on Monday, the tight end uh, out of California. The thought process uh, from what I'd heard was that Texas would get some commitments in before Arch would show up. And that that would be the thing that starts the Arch Manning official visit weekend and that they could carry the good vibes and all of the good momentum through that and then kind of see where things stand after that. Because even though Arch Manning and like people, it's funny, Arch hasn't gone on the record and said this in a quote. His father hasn't said this. Peyton hasn't said this. But the grapevine talk and, and probably the highest level source that has gone on the record to indicate that this is a possibility is his head coach. His head coach did an article, uh, did several interviews back in May, did one with Rivals, did one with The Athletic. And in those interviews, he mentioned that Arch might take this thing into the early part of the season, something that we've been reporting for a long time, but an idea that was slow to gain steam, I think, from Texas fans who've been thinking this is going to happen fast, this is going to happen soon, he's going to be the guy that starts all of this momentum for the Longhorns. It hasn't quite happened that way. Uh, And, you know, I don't know when Arch is going to commit. I do know that this weekend, Texas hopes that this is the kind of thing that gets him to get on board with the idea of him actually being a Longhorn when this thing's all said and done. I think it really is a Georgia-Texas battle. I haven't heard that anything happened on the Alabama visit this weekend that would have changed that. So this is a big moment in the recruitment of um, Arch Manning. He's seen Georgia. He will see Texas. He and his people are saying that he will continue to make visits into the fall. If you're Texas, you would love for this visit to be the knockout punch. You would love that he – And all of his concerns could somehow be washed away so that he could come out of this weekend feeling like in the next couple of weeks, next month or so, that he feels a comfort level uh, that would help him pledge for the Longhorns before the season starts because things have been a little bit slow in recruiting. It's slow for everybody. I I think that's one of the first things we should talk about tonight on the show is that recruiting in the state of Texas, which is where Texas is going to be doing most of its business each and every year. And thanks, Paul, for uh, the vacation shout out. That wasn't even necessarily supposed to happen. It just kind of did. True story. I brought my lights. I brought brought my microphone. I took all that stuff to Gavelson. And then it just didn't quite happen for me. And the next thing you know, you're in the middle of three or four days where you haven't done any work or at least a little bit of work. And then people just say, yeah, I'm making a vacation. And then, it's like a little mini vacation, but I did enjoy it. Thanks for the kind words, Paul. I think that, you know, when you look at the top prospects in the state of Texas this year, nine of the top 10 in my own personal LSR top 10 haven't made commitments yet. I mean, here, let me, while I'm talking, let me pull up my LSR top 10, my top 100, and we'll go, we'll go through each of them. And You know, the only guy that I have in the top 10, there's two, two guys from the top 10 committed. I've got Ryan Niblett, who's committed to Texas, ranked number six. And I've got Bravion Rogers, the cornerback out of LaGrange, committed to Texas A&M. To be fair, the number 11 player, Peyton Bowen from Denton Guyer, committed to Notre Dame. So three of the top 11. But what that also means, and Ben, I will, Ben says, where can we get your LSR list? It's on the website. If you go to orangebloods.com, go to the football navigation bar, and when that pops up, 
if you look down towards the bottom, you'll see my rankings. But for you, Ben, I will actually tweet those out right now while I'm doing the show. That's how interactive I'll try to be with you guys. Look, my LSR 2023 top 100 for Ben G. There you go. I'm tweeting it out. That was special for you, Ben. <laughs> I don't know if it'll let me type in an address into the chat bar, but if it will, I'll put it in there as well. If you look at my rankings, David Hicks Jr., undecided. Anthony Hill, linebacker from Denton Ryan, undecided. Uh, Javion Toviano, the cornerback from Arlington Martin, undecided. Ruben Owens, Jonte Cook, Malik Muhammad, Marcus Deal. Uh, yeah, Michael, go ahead and share that on screen if, you, if you'd if you like to. I don't know if how exactly that helps with the – address on the screen but anything that'll help people out um will make it easy for them. marcus deal undecided jaquay's pet away undecided if you were going to tell me from ask me from that list who i think could commit to the longhorns before the end of the summer or even before the end of this month i think john T. cook from desoto he's the obvious one Keep an eye on Jaquay's Petaway, the wide receiver from Langham Creek. I think the combination of him and Cook could make a decision, if not before the end of this month, before the end of the summer. Those are two guys that the Longhorns feel, um, I think, really good about. And I think that the combination of Niblet with Cook and Petaway would be a real sales point for Arch Manning. And I think that, you know, I think – I think when you look at some of the hints that John Tay Cook has been making, I think that really and truly it's this idea that Arch Manning comes and they're going to surround him with wide receiver talent and skill talent along with the offensive linemen. I think that's what they're trying to sell, what that image is. John Tay Cook and Petaway, a couple of guys that are big pieces of that equation, What's interesting about Petaway is that, you know, he's scheduled to be on campus this weekend. So that would go a long way. You know, I, I think the Longhorns want to put Petaway in Arch Manning's little pocket and that those two guys do everything and go everywhere together. Um, you guys, Michael, you can go ahead and take that off the full screen now. I really just wanted to point out by showing that part of the list it's not like a bunch of guys are going to Texas A&M right now. They, if I'm not mistaken, A&M sitting on four or five Scott, uh, commitments at this point. You know, TCU picked up a commitment from Avion Carter, the kid out of Amarillo, but that's a little bit of an exception to the, the general recruiting rules. Javon Thomas, the cornerback from Oak Cliff, committed to A&M. But outside of that, outside of that, it's not like A&M's doing a bunch of damage with the elite of the elite kids inside the state of Texas at this point, right? I mean, just because they've got a couple doesn't mean that they don't lead with a couple of others. Same thing with Texas. However, as it stands, only one of the top nine kids in the state have committed. The Longhorns have time to do some damage, to create an impact. We saw that a little bit with the visit of David H. Jr. last week. Uh, it doesn't... I'm not going to overreact and say that because he visited Austin one time that suddenly he's a, the Longhorns are a leader. That's a bit far fetched at this point, but in making that first visit, and then I think committing to visit again, it's the Longhorns involved in a way that it didn't seem like they were involved in very much prior to that visit. I mean, the Longhorns weren't really in the top five in the sense that, David Hicks's official visit list is kind of ridiculous when you look at it. It's, you know, Miami last weekend, Michigan State the weekend before that, How Oregon this weekend. How in the hell are those schools getting visits over Texas for the number one player in the state of Texas? Doesn't make any sense from my perspective, but it is what it is. Rodolfo is saying, I feel like Owens has fallen away. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that at all. I think that 
and I said this in my column this weekend because Ruben Owens is he's saying all kinds of stuff, right? He comes out of the TCU visit and he's like, yo, TCU is kind of hot. And they're telling me that why go be in a solar system of stars when I can just be my own galaxy and be the single biggest um you know, guy in a recruiting class and that they'll build the program and NIL. I don't listen to Ruben Owens right now. No offense to Ruben Owens. Okay. But Ruben Ru- leading for Ruben Owens right now is like leading for the Heisman in September. It's not the worst thing in the world, right? I mean, I, I, <laughs> I can't say that it's a terrible thing that he would list anybody as a leader in June and that that school shouldn't take that. I'm just telling you that being Ruben Owens' leader in June is like leading the Heisman in September. It's way more than likely by the time we get to, July, you know, in, in this case in the football season in November that things will have changed I think Texas A&M is still the team to beat for Texas with Ruben Owens. And I think, you know, I think everybody, I've been pretty consistent in saying this. And I think Jason Sukumel has kind of said the same thing. Um, Arch Manning could be a big piece of the Ruben Owens puzzle. If Texas gets Arch, I think it really, opens the door for Reuben Owens. It's not closed to them if they don't get Arch, but Arch is a megawatt star that I think Reuben Owens has connected to some degree with during this recruiting process. It would help. Benji says your list is legit by not having TJ Shanahan as the number one player in the state. I'd argue he wasn't even the best player on Westlake Well, he wasn't the best player on Westlake. There were at least a couple of guys better last season than TJ Shanahan. No offense to TJ Shanahan, who I think is a perfectly fine four-star prospect. I think he's got a chance to be a really good college player. I don't watch TJ Shanahan and think to myself, oh, that guy is the Arch Manning of offensive linemen. Just – doesn't happen. I don't watch him and think David Hicks or TJ Shanahan. Hmm. I should just spend all my no 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 no. no. Uh, TJ Shanahan, a castaway, David Hicks Jr. <laughs> By all means, come on down. Um, Rodolfo also asks, is Cook a better high school player than Xavier Worthy? I wouldn't say that. Player, you know, it, Xavier Worthy didn't get his senior season. I, and that's both in football and in track. So when we talk about his exploits, um, I think that Damien, I'm going to star that question. And uh, this one right here, just so you know, I don't want to take it right this second, Damien, but I'll get to that before we get started. I don't want to distract myself from a little bit of the football discussion that we're having right now. Um, I think Cook and Xavier Worthy at this time in their careers, essentially the same prospect, not apple for apple in terms of skill set, but for me, they're both national top 50 kind of guys. They both bring as prospects and Xavier should have been a five star. That's the thing. I think if Xavier had played a senior year, there's a good chance that he would have ended up as a five star so that along with the 10-4 speed in the 100, that as a senior in high school, he didn't get a chance to build off of that. I don't even know what Xavier Worthy's 40-time or true like 100-meter time speed is. The last time we've seen him officially clocked was in high school. Not exactly sure um, you know, where that is today. I would put Worthy a smidge over Cook. But – in terms of where he was ranked and where Cook is ranked now, I've got Cook just on the cusp of five-star status. I don't have him quite there. Uh, look, the bottom line is both of those kids should enter college 
with about a 40 or 50 percent chance of being NFL drafted players when it's all said and done. Obviously, after one year, Xavier Worthy, his stock seems way more higher than like he's now he he has to stay healthy. That's the thing for like what would have to happen for Xavier Worthy to not be drafted in a couple of years? It reminds me of in Jerry Maguire when uh, Rod Tidwell's brother has the tragic bass fishing accident. Like that would be it. That'd be it. You'd have to be, it, it would take a tragic bass fishing accident for Xavier Worthy not to get drafted. And, you know, John Tate cooks at about half those odds at this point. Uh, someone asks, do you still keep in touch with McComas? Yeah. I mean, we, we chat, we chat a whole lot on the phone. I mean, he's busy. I'm not a big phone guy. And, you know, it's weird. I used to talk to McComas literally every day in our Slack channel, just about everything. I need to call. I need to check in with McComas. It's been a minute. It's been the baseball season. I tend to leave people alone when I know that they're busy and working. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I love Dustin McComas. Um, ben says, <laughs> Miss McComas, hashtag coys. That, you know what? That may be the reason why I haven't talked to him in a while. I'm kind of on tilt. Ever since Tottenham got a draw from Liverpool late in the season, and it was very costly for my Reds, I have just not wanted to be nice to a single person. That includes you now too, Ben. Uh, Chris, you want the number for my barber? That's just me, baby. That's just me. If you need your head shaved, I will either do it for you or I can show you how to do it. Uh, Gabe says, bold prediction. Evan Stewart will transfer to Texas after one season in Jimbo's underwhelming offense. I mean, it's not the craziest thing in the world, really and truly. Look, the thing that I've had to recalibrate my brain towards, and, and I think everybody else is going to have to do so as well. The portal is about for a lot of schools. And I think Texas has a chance to be one of these schools. It's about to either equal or replace the high school ranks as the most important recruiting piece of the talent acquisition puzzle. Let me tell you what's going to happen when the season's over with. Everybody, James McDaniel with a little bit of love in the super chat. Thank you, James. I appreciate that. Uh, ben, I see your question. I'll get to, I, I got a bunch of questions that I've starred. So don't worry in a little bit. I'll go back to the questions that I haven't answered yet. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, Chris, come on home. Um, I will answer your questions. Don't think that you've asked them early that I won't come back. As a matter of fact, I have seven questions. Eric, Rodolfo, Nate, Damien, Paul, James, Ben, I got Questions from all of you star that I will get back to. Um, where was I? No, I've lost my train of thought. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll take a question from the board now that uh, I've completely, you know, lost myself. Ooh, Ben with a super chat. I'll tell you what, Nate. I'm going to come right back. I'll answer Nate real quick. Is Shannon Spencer uh, underrated or a legit just a three-star? Here's what he's not, Nate. He's not a national top 100 type of prospect. He doesn't have the suddenness or the explosiveness that at 6'7", 240 that you would look for for a guy that would be ranked in that tier. And at that point, it doesn't really matter where you're ranked. Mid four-star, uh, low four-star, high three-star. All of it pretty much pans out about the same at best, 25%. Um, in some cases, you're talking about 15%. If that's confusing at all, here's the thing that you need to know. 80% of the guys in Shannon Spencer's classification of his tier ranking, right? The 80% fail to get drafted in the NFL. And drafted in the NFL usually coincides with being a really good college player. You, as a general rule of thumb, when I give you one of these drafted numbers, you can add 10% and 
And that extra 10% is good college player, just didn't get drafted. But those guys are far and few between the guys that are really good college players that for whatever reason don't get drafted. One of the reasons why, two reasons why I like to use the draft dynamic as a barometer. Number one, there's no opinion. It's not, there's no, my bias and the, there's no subjectiveness to it. Either you were drafted or you weren't. And then it doesn't require me to like arbitrarily decide what translates to good. It's subjective. I say damn good. And some people think the words damn good means awesome. And some people think that damn good is like, oh, this is pretty good. And so I love the NFL draft because it takes the subjectiveness out of it, at least from my ability to, or need to determine what the data means. And, you know, that's the main part of it. Real quick, let's go to the super chat. Because, hello, is that Siobhan? If I said that wrong, I apologize. He jumps in, te- uh, catch how many wide receivers do you think Texas lands? I assume that's what you mean. We land in the 2023 class, three or four. And I think I've kind of outlined them. Like, look, this is the Texas wide receiver recruiting class in a nutshell. Th- this trio, to me, is what they want. And if they can add another badass mofo behind it, perfect. But they've already got Ryan Niblett, who I think is one of the best prospects in the entire class. He's a borderline five-star guy for me. That speed is so legit that it makes me drool. And I don't drool a lot over prospects after 20-something years. Ryan Niblett will make a dude drool. Niblett, John T. Cook, Jaquay's Petaway. To me, those are the three. And I think that if you if you made me put like a hundo down on a recruiting prediction, I'd probably do that one, okay? Niblet, Cook, Petaway. The Petaway thing, as I mentioned earlier in the video, if you missed it, he's coming in this weekend. That is by design, in my opinion. As a matter of fact, if I wouldn't shock me if before we get to the end of June – that we see Petaway as a Texas commitment. Maybe I'm being crazy, but I do know that there are some people in the Texas universe uh, that really believe that this thing's going to shake out exactly like that. Paul, you got a lot of questions about, uh, a ton of questions about Niblet. Hit me with them. Before that, though, let's go back to the Super Chat. Longhorn Recruiting Super Chat, 999. Do you think, we still get that commit before Arch comes to town. I assume you're talking about John Tay Cook. No, <laughs> mainly because I've got 48 hours. So on one hand, on one hand, I'm saying no because we've only got 48 hours. But John Tay Cook did say earlier today that you know, he was like soon with a little – hourglass thing i've got john tay cook future casted um to the longhorns that's not changing i've heard nothing that would make me think that i had been hearing from people that that thing would go down before arch manning would show up on campus it hasn't happened yet at this point you know what is it what is today's wednesday right so we're less than 48 hours away. The math probably says that's not going to happen. But be on the lookout for that. I mean, that happened today. I predicted, or I at least first mentioned this idea that um, the 15th would be a day to keep an eye on. It should be noted, like for the record, that he put that message out. That seemed, you know, when you put soon with an hourglass, it would make you indicate that you were going to be making a decision potentially sometime soon. I'm just saying, uh, Ben, uh, pair of character looking at himself in the mirror. Thanks for blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yeah, Ben, that's not, I, whatever. Uh, I thought that was a super chat. You fooled me. And at that point you're now on, well, no, it says 20 USD. That's weird. Is that a super chat or not? What the hell's a super sticker? I don't 
Um, Ben, you be you, my man. Uh, bro, he's like, bro, that was a sticker. That was the sticker. I'm so confused. You, let me tell you what. It's shit like that that makes me feel old at 46. Damien says, any worries that JW mentioned K Banks and Cam as standouts and not mentioning DJ Campbell? Damien, good question. Let me tell you what I've heard about DJ Campbell this week from a source that I've got to vet a little bit more. I've heard that DJ Campbell came in a little leaner in, um, in terms of poundage that he lost about 20 pounds before he got on campus. I've heard he looks great. I wonder what that does for him in terms of being ready for this season. I mean, I kind of like, no offense, I wasn't looking at DJ Campbell and thinking to myself, lose 20 pounds and you'll get on the field quicker. Uh, I kind of thought just fine tune where you are. I don't want to change you a lot. I need to check check on DJ Campbell. It's not double sourced, but yeah, D Taylor saying DJ did play basketball a lot this year. That's what I've been hearing. That he played a lot of basketball. That he might have lost some weight, and um, you know, we'll see. Does it? Am I worried that you know it was that Banks and Cam are standouts? No, not really. I think it's good that Banks is being mentioned. It doesn't hurt that Cam is being mentioned. I don't think any of it matters until August. I mean, you'd rather they be mentioned than not. What's important is you're not hearing that, oh, this guy showed up looking like, oh, God, Taylor Bible. Back in the day, Taylor Bible showed up, and everybody from Jump Street were like, <laughs> Oh, I just remembered someone brought up, Brent Dickey brought up the Evan Stewart thing. I remember the point I was going to make. As soon as I'm done talking about this particular situation, I will circle back to the point I completely spaced out on a second ago. No, don't be worried. Nobody's mentioning any of these guys in the Taylor Bible. They showed up looking pregnant kind of standpoint. And that to me is the most important thing. Don't be a guy that comes in and people are like, what the hell happened to him? As long as you don't fall into what the hell happened to them category, I think you're okay. They've got two months to really get themselves ready. I think that point can't be lost. I'd much rather hear in a month from now that Cam, you know, has showed up and made gradual improvement every week. And now he looks like a beast. Just something to think about. Uh, oh God, why in the hell would I ever make, uh, a Kendall Jones reference like that guy? I don't even know if that guy even made it to college, just kind of a crazy situation. All right. So let me circle back around to the thing that I was talking about. And then I'm going to go back to some questions. Uh, I think the portal is so important. And when John A. Barron toyed with going into the portal, just what, like a month and a half ago? The thinking at the time was he just wanted to stick his toes in the water and find out what his value is. Every kid on this on, on the Texas campus was watching. All the kids on all of the campuses have been watching. What you're going to see when this season ends, is a bunch of dudes jump into the portal, not to leave the schools that they're at, to gauge what their NIL value in an open market is. So next year, the market is going to be lit. Excuse me for, I just, I felt really old saying lit for whatever reason. I, I really did feel 46 then, <laughs> lit. Shouldn't be my word. And But it's going to be. It's going to be. And the guys are going to be in the portal. And as I've talked to the agents, as I've talked to representatives of players who aren't quite agents but speak on behalf of them in this NIL world, I think that next year in the portal, you're going to be able to get whatever you want. 
If you need a D tackle, they're going to be D tackles. If you need a starting linebacker, you're going to this this last year. <laughs> See, now Ben's just making me laugh because that is legitimately funny. Uh, next year, you're going to want to have scholarship spots available for what hits the portal. And Texas has a growing reputation for being a school that kids at other schools realize they're paying money. And what I had heard, my little, little, little birdies chirping in my ear have kind of indicated to me Every single transfer that has come Texas's way through the portal is going to make six figures easy. They're going to have opportunities, NIL opportunities for all of the guys that transferred in, most of them in the quarter of a million dollars or more range. I mean, that is real money. It talks. And... The, the downside to that is there are a lot of kids on campus right now not making 250 gur through NIL at Texas, but they're looking at the transfers make that kind of money. And I think that's the thing that people didn't realize with Jade Barron is that the word on the street was that he was just trying to get some of that transfer cash. And don't think that these dudes on the roster don't realize like, Oh, the portal is how I get my cash. That is going to be what everybody across the country does next year. How like to what volume, man, I can't say what I can tell you is I expect the portal next year to be significantly stronger than it was this year. And I found the portal this year to be extremely strong. Uh, Eric Torres saying, that um, wide receiver Wyoming 350K signed, sealed, and delivered. Like, I don't know about that. I don't know. But, but that money, that as an NIL opportunity, that area of money is what I've told is available. So, you know, anyway, that answered that. Was it, you know, I, I think that, when, so when we talk about wide receiver class and I tell you, Niblet, Cook, Petaway, and then a fourth. I think we've all got to like stick it in our brains. Every position that that Texas or anybody else, but especially Texas, whatever they need to be hitting and recruiting, they need to be saving spots for the portal. They need to be saving spots for five stars and disgruntled high four stars and guys that have been starters at other schools. This is an opportunity at the very beginning of the, before, if it should ever happen, right? Before NIO is ever truly legislated or whatever, this is like Texas's chance to continue to take advantage of what looks like a strength for them. And right now it has been a strength. And you, you know, it was pointed out by Eric just a second ago about Nayor uh, ended up like having an opportunity to make $350,000. Look, man, that kid committed to Tennessee. He flipped to Texas. What happened? What do we think happened? Did he change his mind about the offense? Did he learn something about the offense? Probably not. Is there something about his education that suddenly he know? No, man. Texas likely, likely, was able to ex explain to him how the NIL opportunities at Texas would beat Tennessee. Simple as that. Uh, Rila Wren, great handle, by the way. Is Arch even willing to redshirt with the portal and starting somewhere else could be easier, assuming if Quinn lives up to the hype? So the cool thing about uh, Arch Manning is that he seems – look, man, that Manning family, they've done this before. And I remember talk about me being old. I was around for Eli Manning's recruitment. I mean, I know I look really young, but I've been around for <laughs> I've been around I've been around for a while. I can I I talked to Archie about Eli in the middle of that recruitment. I on the day that, or the weekend that Eli Manning made his official visit to Texas, I met Eli and Arch on the field 
before Cleve Bryant threatened to murder me. And we did an interview on the field and we talked to Archie and like had a real good feel for how that recruitment was going. And they were very patient. And they early playing time wasn't a big deal. And hey, Shavam, hold on to that thought. I'm gonna, I, I see the questions still coming in. Believe me, I will get to more questions. If it means hanging out for a little more than an hour, then it means hanging out for a little more than an hour. Uh, but I think Rilo's question's an interesting. Is he willing to redshirt given that the portal thing exists now? Look, the portal is going to be a get out of jail card for Arch Manning should he ever need one. But look, Arch is going to make seven figures. He's going to do it pretty easily. And he doesn't need Texas, and he doesn't need Georgia, and he doesn't need Alabama to do that. He has the name Manning as the number one ranked quarterback in the country. My expectations that our Arch Manning will do four or five NIL deals. He'll make about four or five million dollars a year off of it. They're not, he's not going to be hustling at the mall signing autographs. It's going to be big deals. And so I think the entire I think his entire situation somewhat changes. From what I've heard from the Manning with people with information into his recruitment is that Quinn Ewers and his presence on the University of Texas does two things for Texas that are good. Number one, Quinn is the savior, right? Quinn Ewers is the guy that's supposed to turn this thing around now for Steve Sarkeesian in this program. That's not really the case with the idea is that Arch shows up and Starkeesian and company have already got this thing cooking. And then he's able to take over without the pressure of having to be this school's Lord and savior. And the other thing is Quinn Ewers probably going to play a couple more years of football before he heads off to the NFL. The Quinn Ewers plan is to play this year and next year and then go to the NFL. Well, if Manning signs with Texas, that means in 2023, he can redshirt or play up to four games and yours will just do his thing. And so unlike most quarterbacks, right? Unlike rising, unlike Casey Thompson in his first year, I unlike Quinn Ewers, I don't think you're going to see a situation where Arch Manning puts his name into a portal after the first five months of his collegiate career. But if things go sideways, if he's unhappy, if he were to come to Texas and get beaten out by Malik Murphy, I mean, you know, he he has options. But I don't think that there's, in my mind, of all the kids that we could be talking about leaving after one year, I think Arch Manning, no matter where he goes, he's the guy that I least expect to do that. They preach patience with the Mannings. I don't think if he's starting by his second year, they're completely freaking out. No, Eli didn't really kick on at Ole Miss until really his senior season, but his junior year started to play better. And then his senior year, he was lights out. Peyton started slow at Tennessee. I think people forget about that. So the Manning family, they are focused more on the finish line than the starting line. And I think that that's a good thing for Texas. All right, let me go to some of these pen questions. And uh, we'll just knock some of these out that uh, I haven't already got to. Damien says, how did OB get started? Okay. So from 95 to 99, I was working at KI42, the CBS TV affiliate in Austin. In, 19, in the spring of 99, because I had been doing recruiting coverage for the TV station, Bobby Burton and Shannon Terry – both who are with on three now and we're a part 24 seven. And I don't know, I've lost track of the, all the networks they've been involved in, but they were the guys that started rivals. They hired me to do Lone Star recruiting and Heisman.com. And then rivals went through $200 million of venture capital in like two years uh, and went bankrupt. And then when it went bankrupt, Shannon Terry took over. So Shannon Terry was it was uh, Jim Heckman and Bobby Burton. They were the guys that brought me in. And then Shannon Terry was the guy that was like, hey, we want you to do the Texas site. And I was like, hell yeah, 
I want to do the Texas site. That's where the money's at. Forget about being a recruiting analyst. And in 2001, that is how theuniversity.com got started. And then a couple of years ago, we changed it. A, a couple of years after that, I think 2002, 2003, we changed it to orangebloods.com. I hired, I hired Jason Sukumel in year two, and off we go. Uh, let's see. Paul had a question earlier that said, I've read that Texas having Wisner mean it's more logical to target Owens, uh, vice Baxter. Do you agree? Not really. To me, Trey Wisner shouldn't impact the recruitment of a truly elite of the elite running back. He's the wingman to this situation. If you've gone out and seen uh, Top Gun Maverick, Right, he he ain't maybe he's rooster, yeah, maybe he's rooster, but no, I don't look at Trey Wisner and think that he should then logically somehow be the thing that changes or decides who Texas targets at running back. He's the wingman in this situation, from my estimation, and those other two guys, especially Reuben Owens. Uh, they should be the the things dictating things and not vice versa. Uh, James McDaniel says, which former players do you still keep in contact with, if any? I need to check in with the former players. You know, I haven't talked to Chance Mock in a long time, and Chance was my boy. The thing is funny is Chance reached out to me as soon as I moved to the Woodlands a year ago. I was like, let's go out and do lunch. I haven't done that. Um Hmm. Yeah, I haven't been keeping up with a lot of former players other than I don't want to mention the guys that I do talk to because quite frankly, <laughs> from a sourcing standpoint, that could expose them. Um, I, I talk to Quandre Diggs every once in a while through social media. I don't have to worry about Quandre. He's not exactly tipping me off with scoop from Seattle. A lot of the guys that are done playing that go to practice, I try to keep those names to myself so that uh, they can help me out occasionally when they go to practice and the coaches don't have it open and you guys are dying for practice nuggets of who caught a pass in practice? I need my fix. You know, we have to do those things from time to time. Uh, ben says, is the Texas high school football connections as important as they were 15 years ago still? No. Um, they're not unimportant, but especially now in the world of NIL, even though we haven't really crossed a lot of kids who are like, talk to my representatives, seven on seven wide receiver coaches, tight end coaches, my O line coach, like whatever the case that may be. Um, it's still the head coach and the coaches at the high school level aren't as important as they used to be, but they're still important. Uh, and I don't expect that to completely change. And I hell hasn't completely changed that yet, but I do wonder uh, in the next five years, if that significantly changes at this point, you know, it used to be that the high school coaches were in total control. That's not the case anymore. Now they have, a little control and do they still have a little control? Yeah. Do they still have massive control? And that kind of went out the door a long time ago. I can remember, you know, coach Welch over at Copper's Cove for 20 years telling us that we couldn't interview his kids until after they were done with their senior seasons and that he didn't want them thinking about recruiting and all of this other stuff. Like, <laughs> What in what world in 2022 do you tell a kid you can't start thinking about your recruiting process until after your senior year? That's just not going to fly, and it doesn't fly, and it hasn't flown. Um, so yeah, I would say that it's not as important as it was 15 years ago. It's probably about the same though as it was three to five years ago. The shift and the change started in the last decade. I don't know that what's happened in the last two or three years has yet hugely impacted the high school scene. I think those things were already happening. Uh, I told you I would come back. 
Shavam, to this question, how many O-line is Texas going to sign in 2023? I think the goal would be to sign probably three or four. The thing that Texas is running into is after two hugely historical offensive line years in the state of Texas, we are now in a, in a year that's a down year. I mean, when you look at the offensive linemen who you've got – if, if we go off of my rankings, right, I've got Harris Sewell as a mid-four-star guy. I've got TJ Shanahan as a mid-four-star guy. Most importantly, I've got Jaden Chapman as a mid-four-star guy. Chapman's a guy that Texas should, I think, feel really comfortable with. In fact, there's been some future casts. Nick Harris put in a future cast for him very recently. As a matter of fact, I've been meaning to do that this week. OK, this will be the first future cast I put in in the middle of a live video, but I'm going to put my Jaden Chapman future cast in. Bing, just did that. Um, I think Texas. Here's what I think Texas is going to do. I think they're going to take an underwhelming offensive line class. I think they're going to take Chapman. And I think they're going to take some guys that are low four stars, high three stars. They come with 80 percent projected miss rates and I think they should be patient and go through the portal and go two and two I think you sign Chapman I think you get another guy that you think is on the cusp of being elite of the elite and then I don't think you mess around with these these more likely to miss than hit prospects I think you assess what happens with your offensive line during the season I think you look for high level former high-level prospects in the portal or guys with starting experience. And I think that's what you do with your four. I hate the idea of Chapman and then three guys with 85% projected miss rates. Uh, real quick, last question that I have started, and then I'll go back to the, the live chat. I haven't been paying attention to it while I've taken this. Ran asked, Catch, are you happy or underwhelmed with the Darwin Nunes signing? I'm in love with the Darwin Nunes signing. And this isn't just me making this up because Liverpool signed him uh, officially yesterday, although the paperwork and everything. I don't think technically he can become a Liverpool player until July 1st, but the agreement and the contract and all that stuff has already been agreed to. As soon as I saw that dude play Liverpool in the quarterfinals of the Champions League, I wanted him. And I feared that he would go to a Manchester United or something like that and then I'd have to see Liverpool play against that guy twice or three times a year for the next decade. I'm ecstatic. Now, I think Liverpool have some other things that they need to do in this transfer window. Like you see, I got my Liverpool shirt on right now. Uh, I love the Darwin Nunes signing. I I, I am not ter terribly worried about whether he gets 20 goals this season. I think he is a long-term replacement for Mo Salah, who I think is going to play one more year. I think he's going to leave. And then off we go, and then you'll see Nunez and Diaz and Jota and anybody else that they add at that point uh, from there on. Okay, back to the football stuff. Eric asks, are the Brockermeyers coming home? I, I'm going to say yes. But the Brockermeyers aren't making a dent on the Alabama depth chart yet. And I wonder what it looks like if some of the guys from this class that just – if Kelvin Banks blows up and starts as a true freshman and, 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 and from day one looks like a guy that's going to be in the NFL one day, I mean, suddenly is Tommy Brockermeyer coming to Texas? Like, why would that make sense? So I think it's it could absolutely be in the cards – I do wonder if there's a day where they could have waited too long, not through anything that they would have done that was wrong, but wherever a Tommy Brockermeyer transfers, if he eventually transfers from Alabama, you know, will that impact what Texas does? It remains to be seen. I will say perfect example of why you're saving a spot or two in the transfer portal for exactly that. And I will say this, his, James Brockermeyer has been a guy that is on the two deep at Alabama. He's played some guard. He's played some center. Tommy has been the guy that's had a harder time getting on the two deep. 
if you can believe that. So the other thing is they just finished a redshirt season. We shouldn't be overreacting that two guys who are entering their second year haven't cracked the two deep at the either number one or number two school for recruiting of offensive linemen uh, across the country. Although it does need to be said, the Alabama people not real happy with their offensive line coming out of the spring. So it's not like he's being blocked by a bunch of dudes that are just automatically going to the NFL. That actually hasn't been the case at this point. We shall see. I mean, obviously watching what happens with them is something that we all, you know, we're all going to do that this year. How big of a dent can they make in getting onto that too deep and how impatient will they be if it doesn't happen through a couple of years? On 10, Dudas, I hope I said that right. Does Javion Taviano visit Texas since he canceled his Georgia visit? Got to check. It's not outside the realm of possibilities. Uh, I, you know, I just, you know, I tell you what I'll do. Uh, I'm going to send a little, I'll see if I can't get an answer. I'll have Sukumel try to, hold on. I just sent Sukumel a message. I'm going to have him do the dirty work on this question. I don't think there's anything yet, but we'll let we'll we'll check into it. That that if if Toviano could come in for an official visit, I mean this weekend would be fantastic. But you got to get that guy on campus, and you know at this point that is something that Texas is still trying to do. Uh, and yes, Ben says. I love Toviano. I just hope we can get another shot a year ago. Exactly. Ben, bingo was his name Uh Super chat. Will the Eli tape ever see the light of day? Probably not. If it's the Eli tape that I think you're talking about, all gone. All gone. It's very disappointing. I don't know what would have happened to it. That was a long time ago. I mean, that that was November of 1998 when Eli visited, either October or November. Um, God, Cleve Bryant was pissed at me that day. Uh, let's see, what other questions? It's going to be wrapping things up with just a couple of minutes to go. Hold on. Um, Sukumel says, at this point, Toviano won't say. So we're checking with other sources uh, to confirm what, what it might mean for him to cancel the Georgia visit. Don't have that exactly. Uh, Gabe says, have I ever been to Omaha for the College World Series? I have not. It's wild. Didn't do it. Well, Texas baseball was pretty garbage when I was in college. You know, that was the end of the gush years. They weren't garbage, but they weren't really competing for, you know, I've covered regionals on so many levels. I mean, one of the first jobs I did uh, for the Texas SID office back in the day, one of my first paying gigs was to cover the Texas regional when Miami came to town and Pat Burrell put on an absolute show. Um, So no, but I have never been to Omaha. You know, part of that is I just don't want to go to Omaha. Can, is that bad? Is that bad? I just don't want to go to Omaha. No offense to anybody that lives in the state of Nebraska, but I just, not even the College World Series has made me want to go to Omaha. And that comes from somebody that used to watch that Omaha Safari show, whatever that was. Omaha Mutual? I don't, I don't really remember. Shavam or Shavam asks, and by the way, Do me a favor. If you're going to be in the super chat, you're going to be in these chats. I hate to say a name wrong. So if you could message me either through email or whatever, is it Shavam or Shavam? I got to believe it's Shavam. Like Shavam feels like a very Southern thing. Shavam. Like I feel like Gomer Pyle would say Shavam, uh, but maybe that's it. Shavam sounds right. I want to make sure that I'm getting it right. Malik Muhammad. And I'll make sure I check the Twitter in the or the stream of message here to make sure that if you tell me uh, I'm paying attention, uh, 
I think Ben has the correct answer. The answer is both. Malik Muhammad or Toviano? Uh, yes, please. If, if you had to take one, I'm taking Toviano. I have him rated as a five-star prospect. I have Malik Muhammad rated as a high four-star prospect. They're both in the tier of prospects that you want, but I do have Toviano ranked higher. There would be no reason for me to say any other answer at this point. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. I appreciate that. Woo! <laughs> if I was giving away gummies today, uh, you'd be hard pressed to not uh, let that be in absolute consideration for post of the night. Uh, Paul asks, why did I move to the Woodlands? It's real simple, Paul. I wanted to stay married. No, seriously. Heather, my wife, moved to Austin in 2006 to essentially be with me. And it had been 16 years, 15 years, and I don't have a lot of family, and she does. And what ultimately um, – I had told her somewhere along the line, if it ever was possible that we could make the move so that she could be closer to her family, that I would do so after, you know, the height of the pandemic and not being around anybody for most of a year, it felt really important to get her and the kids near some family. And like they've been out this afternoon with their grandfather and their grandmother at the pool, you know, it's those types of things we couldn't do in Austin. And uh, I was trying to be a good husband and a good dad. Ultimately, uh, that's the answer to that question. Uh, Paul says, Cody, the real MVP with that quip. That is so funny. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, look, I don't see any other questions that I've missed. It's been an hour. Gabe says, any chance for another conversation with Billy Lucci on the channel? You know what? I'll reach out to Billy. You know, Billy's got, you know, the thing is, I don't want Billy to, I don't want to ask Billy like, hey, come on the Orange Bloods channel and then he not be able to do anything with it. Doesn't seem fair unless he wanted to turn around and say, hey, you do me, I'll do you. And no, don't, don't turn that into uh, something gross. Uh, but you know what I'm talking about. Like if, if we both did something for the others, um, website, media, affiliate, uh, we'll figure it out. It was a lot of fun doing it last year. You know, at the end of the day, Billy's a funny, good dude. Uh, he and I don't always agree on UT and AM football stuff. Uh, but as a human being, as a guy, everybody typically likes Billy. Billy's probably more popular than I am. I'm like the ass. Nobody ever calls Billy an asshole. I've been charged with that a few times. Yes, Jagmus, like and subscribe to the channel. I've been going for an hour. That's all you got to do. Uh, Rob says, do the Aggie fans skewer me? Yeah, they do. Uh, I think the thing that I miss the most about a and leaving the Big 12 is that for more than a decade, I was easily the most hated media member covering UT football that for a and fans. I still think that might like Ben's like, yeah, they <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for backing me up there with some all capital letters and hate. They do hate me, uh, but it was at off the rails levels uh, in the late nineties in the first decade. Um, Rob says how we can watch that. I don't know. Let me, let me, we had it on. The, if you do a Lucci search, you can go back. Kermit the Frog asks, do I feel good about Arch or no? I mean, I think at this point I would still project them to get Arch. It's a Texas and Georgia. I'll, I'll feel probably more certain one way or the other after this weekend and the official visits have had a chance to wear off and we feel like get a sense for where things are coming out of the visits. But I haven't, I haven't changed my future cast. It's still with Texas. Uh, I think Texas fans should be, feel confident uh, but obviously this weekend's visit will go a long way uh, to determining. Jackie says that Aggies hate everybody. Jackie, you're going to have to trust me on this. They hate me more than most people. 
Just throwing that out there. There's a long history there. Can I tell you? Let me tell. Like, let me tell you guys one of my favorite Aggie stories. Before I ever started OrangeBloods.com, before it ever happened, I was working in the Rivals.com recruiting offices along with Bobby Burton and Jeremy Crabtree. And it was late at night. <laughs> and Texas A&M was about to get two commitments. <laughs> and so... It was, it was late in the recruiting process. It had to be January. And boy, I can't remember who started teasing them. It wasn't me. But the word got out that Texas A&M had a couple of commitments and that they were going to be announced. It was either like at 11 o'clock or midnight or something completely ridiculous. And so the buzz for about five hours is building. Is it Roy Williams? It was in the class of 2000 because they were convinced that Roy Williams was going to flip for Texas to Texas A&M. They worked it into their mind that DJ Williams might have been one of the guys that was getting ready. I mean, anybody that you could possibly think of that was in the 2000 class, Brock Berlin, you name it, they thought that they were going to get those guys. And for five hours, this back in 2000, this is how this, I mean, like I said, my, the hate that A&M fans have with me goes back decades. Finally at midnight, <laughs> what we got going on here? Paul says, I still don't know what to expect from Onward tomorrow night and his uncle Fester limelight. Me either. So at the, at midnight, finally we break the news and it was a kicker by the name of Chris Sims. If you can believe that. One of the weirdest things that has ever happened in recruiting is that Tex, Texas and Texas A&M both had Chris Sims on their rosters at the same time. Hadn't been any since then, but it happened then. So you had Chris Sims as a kicker, and I don't remember the name of the punter, but they got a commitment from a punter and a kicker at midnight in late January when they had spent hours daydreaming that these were going to be the biggest commitments of the year. When I tell you that they got mad at me because it was announced that they'd got a commitment from a punter and a kicker. I mean, they blamed it on me they, as if I was controlling their coaching staff, taking commitments. Yeah. They weren't real happy. So no matter how unhappy you ever are about any commitment that Texas ever gets, Know this, nothing is worse than staying up till midnight in late January, daydreaming that the number one player in the country is about to flip to your school and instead you get two non-ranked kickers and punters. Yeah, man, I'm going to let you know right now, did not go over well, but I enjoyed the hell of that. I, I trolled them that night before trolling was even cool. They hadn't even invented trolling as a term yet on the internet. When I did that to the Aggies, I just let all the A&M people hype it up. And then at midnight, I was like, here's your commitments, punter and a kicker. Surprise. <laughs> oh, and on that, let's see, what do we got here? Kevin says, some in the Georgia program think Arch is a shoe in to go to Athens. Shows how on the DL he's kept this recruitment. Look, man, he likes Georgia a lot, man. I mean, if he goes to Georgia, I'm not going to be shocked. If it was me, I'd probably go to Georgia. They're good. They're good. And Texas has to prove that. By the way, thanks, Jackie, for telling me that that's the funniest recruiting story ever. You don't know how those stories land sometimes. Like, they're funny to me. And maybe everybody else is like, why the hell did you spend three minutes on that story? That's not funny. Uh, believe me, it was it was way funnier in real time. God, I wish there were archives of that. I'd go back and read them right now. Sometimes you, you can't put a price on how funny the early internet was. Uh, ben says that UT offensive players greater than, skill players greater than the UGA offensive skill players. Ben, that might actually be a fact. And you know what? Georgia's still way better. You know why? Because it's got a bunch of dudes that can block and tackle, and, and they win. So 
They don't have better running backs and wide receivers, but they're also not coming off of five and seven in a decade of misery. Look, I'm not saying he's not coming to Texas. I'm just saying that the decision is Georgia versus Texas. And anybody that thinks that Georgia just doesn't have a chance just isn't paying attention. But this weekend is wildly uh, important for Texas. On 10 says, do I ever still talk to Bobby Burton? Nope, not my people. Uh, let's see. I got a Ben says, got better get ready to hand the ball off 35 times a game. Maybe, maybe. I mean, that Georgia offense isn't sexy, but he also knows that the head coach at Georgia will be there for all three, four, or five years of his career. We don't really know that about Sark yet. We don't. Look, five and seven happened. And, you know, that that hasn't impacted Texas at all in this recruitment, other than I think there are still some concerns. I think speaks a lot about Sarkeesian and this staff's ability to recruit and how much the Mannings like Austin and the University of Texas and the Texas football program. And Sarkeesian gets a lot of credit for that. Um Ball Paul says you can't say that about Bobby Burton. We just I don't you know I don't have anything bad to say about anybody. That's he's just not my people. And you know, Bobby and I have a lot of history. I mean, Bobby brought me into the industry. I mean, I was covering recruiting uh at KI 42 for several years. So I can't say he got me started in the industry, but I'm at orangebloods.com because Bobby Burton helped make that possible. So like I'll forever be grateful of the role that Bobby Burton played in my life 25 years ago. Uh, but people change and you know, I don't have anything negative to say about Bobby other than to say Bobby's not, my kind of people kind of simple as that. Um, and on that note, <laughs> let's see, I'll let Ben have the final note. Be better be Bijan last season. The kid deserves to get his money in the NFL. Uh, and then Rilo says, is Quinn a red shirt freshman? Yes, he is. He came in and took a couple snaps last season. Nothing that jeopardized his year of eligibility. Ben says, am I cool with Mike Farrell? Absolutely. I actually exchanged, let me see. Uh, when was the last time I exchanged messages with Mike? I last exchanged a tweet private message with Mike Farrell on June 7th. <laughs> I think I last exchanged a message with Bobby in 2011. I can still remember the phone conversation. I was taking my dogs for a walk the last time I talked to Bobby. It was another network or two ago. Oh, no. He claimed that he was going to wipe me out. And then, you know, he lost and went to another network. It happens. Uh, anyway, on that note, for myself and nobody else, because I'm the only next section, not true. Michael Rockman doing a really good job of holding it down and being a uh, – a great producer for us all. And for all of you who have done the damn thing in the chat today, uh, thank you very much. Catch, you made the drive back on the drive, 2006, 2007, 2008. Uh, you made the drive home back on the radio. I think I know what you're saying. Thank you, Ben. Uh, for everybody else, thanks for being a part of the chat. We'll be doing the Modcast tomorrow morning at 9.30. Um, until then, like, 12 hours. Go get some sleep and we'll see you in the morning. You guys take care. Later.